Today we'll be wrapping up our series in the parables. And so we've actually gone through all of the parables of Matthew in this series. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. Next week uh, we will do kind of a... uh, uh, kind of get us back into the story. We won't actually be starting the story until September 8th, but next week I thought we'd do kind of a sum up of what the entire Old Testament story was about, so that way it's been a few weeks since we've been in it, and so that way kind of a little refresher. And so I hope you can join us next week to get that before we begin the New Testament section of the story. You probably had someone say this to you before, the words, life isn't fair. You've probably heard that said before. You've probably even said it before or had someone say it to you. I know for me, uh, you learn this very quickly in your life, that life isn't fair. Uh, Whether it be something as simple as you look around at the other kids around you and you wonder why one person has the newest gaming system or the newest toys or the newest clothes and you're sitting here going, well, I'm still playing with one of those original NES things that, uh, uh, you know, we're like three or four systems behind now. And you start wondering, why is it that they get that and I don't? And you begin to think, well, life just isn't fair. Or maybe when you become a teen and my car that I first got was a 85 Aries K station wagon, came out in 1984 like cars do. And that was the year I was born. It was the same age as me. It was a family car before it was my car, and uh, the only reason we even had a car for his children was because uh, my parents finally decided they were going to go to a minivan because the three of us boys, who I am the smallest of, uh, were too big to fit in the back seat of a car, and so they had to kind of upgrade a little bit. And so this old Aries K station wagon, which uh, uh, the uh, front door on the driver's side would actually freeze open in the winter, not closed, it was freeze open, and so you had to actually tie it shut using the back door and tie a piece of rope around it and get it in the bench seat through the side door. If you drove more than 25 miles per hour, the back windows would start shaking and going down. You drove over 55, the whole car shook, (laughs) Um, and so you rarely took it out of town at all for any reason, Uh, and so you start looking around, and then I look at my best friend, who I love dearly, had a brand new Chrysler Sebring convertible as his car, and you begin to think, something's not right here, life just isn't fair. Or maybe I go off to college, and my roommate, who... Uh, became one of my best friends and got along with great. We liked to stay up a little too late and often would stay up till two or three in the morning, watching movies, playing video games, talking, whatever it may be. And that was fine for him because even though we both had early 7 a.m. classes, he didn't have to work. His parents paid for his college. And so that meant that he got to take a nap in the afternoon. While my parents did help some with college, I had to work to pay my way through, and so that meant why he was taking his nap to get a little extra sleep, I was working to pay for school. And it just seemed like life wasn't quite fair. Or maybe you get out into the real world of the work and you begin to realize that life isn't fair because it's not really always hard work that gets you ahead, it's the squeaky wheel that gets the grease. And it begins to think whenever, I know whenever I was a server, it wasn't the people that were the best servers that got the best shifts, but the ones that complained the most to the managers. And so it just seemed like life wasn't fair. Now all these things may seem somewhat trivial. I know we kind of had a little fun with it, and it might not seem to be that big of a deal, but I bet you can relate. You probably had something in your life that you thought to yourself, this isn't fair. Whether it was a small thing or a big thing, whether it's something trivial like this or something a little more serious. Maybe you had a job that your family depended on and you needed that promotion so bad, but someone that you thought was your friend at work stabbed you in the back and got the promotion above you by doing something that they knew they shouldn't have done. Maybe it was something that you were in the wrong place at the wrong time and maybe didn't even have anything to do with what you really were, but because you were there, you got fired. Or because you were there, you got arrested. Or something of that nature. And you're thinking to yourself, life just isn't fair. Or maybe you're thinking to yourself, I have been healthy my entire life. Tried to live healthy. Have a good diet. Have all these things I've done so well to be healthy in life. And yet, at an early age, for some reason, I got cancer. 
and you think life just isn't fair. Maybe you were verbally, physically, or sexually abused as a child, and you begin to think to yourself that whenever you mentioned someone or started mentioning someone, it seemed like no one actually would believe you. And you begin to think that there is never any chance of justice, and you start to think to yourself, life just isn't fair. Life isn't fair. Today in our parable, we're going to deal with a little bit of this issue of life not being fair. And so what I want to do is, if you'll open up in your Bible, it's to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. We've got quite a few verses to read through here, so I ask that you just bear with me as we go through these 16 verses. They'll be up on the screen behind me, um, but you can also follow along in your Bible. It's Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. Here Jesus says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, now the third hour would have been about 9 a.m. They started their day at 6 a.m., just to give you a little insight. So about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went, going out again about the sixth hour, so we have about noon, and the ninth hour, about three, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, so we're talking about 5 p.m. here, about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing, and he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. And he said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when the evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired at the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now those who were hired first, they came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And so on receiving it, they grumbled to, at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only an hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have bore the burden of the day and scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I gave to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first, and the first last. Life isn't fair. Most of us can relate probably a lot more with those that were hired first than those that were hired last. We can relate more with those that were hardworking all day long, and it seems like those that are coming in at the last are getting the exact same. And why should the last get the same as the first? It just doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, in our minds, we think the first worked so much harder. They worked for so much longer. Why should they not get more? And over time throughout the history of the church and the history of this parable, the, the characters of this parable, those that came first and those that came last, they, they kind of have been representative of different types of people. And when this parable was first told, it, we think that they probably saw this as the Pharisees and then the tax collectors. You see, the reason why the tax collectors matters is because we've talked about this before, how they were the worst of the worst. And so the Pharisees were seen as good people. They were there working hard the entire time, doing the job they knew they were supposed to do. And then all of a sudden, God was going to allow these tax collectors to come into the fold. That just didn't seem right. It wasn't fair. We're the ones that have been working hard. Why should they get a piece of the pie? It just doesn't make any sense. But then in the early church, they began to see this as those that were Jewish at one time and became Christians and were following along, and they believed in God even before they became Christians, and all of a sudden, Peter and the rest of the church decides they're going to let these Gentiles in. They're going to let the Gentiles come in and be a part of the church, those that were pagans that never believed in God, and yet all of a sudden, they get the same as we do. I've believed in God my entire life, and yet they get the same. This doesn't seem fair. 
And while some people like to focus on who the different characters are, I don't think that's really the point of the parable. I don't think that's what the parable is really talking about because who the characters are matters less than what Jesus is trying to say. And Jesus has something very important to say. In fact, I believe he has one main thing to say and one thing that kind of goes along with it, a secondary thing. I want to focus first on that secondary thing. And that is entrance into the kingdom of heaven is not based on works. Entrance into the kingdom of heaven is not based on works. Now, I've been saying this for weeks now. We've been talking a lot about works and deeds. And in fact, in most times, I've been talking about almost kind of the flip side of this, how much works and deeds matter, that they are important. But we need to realize that no matter how much you do, that is not what gets you into heaven. That is not what gets you where you need to go. Yes, works are important because they reveal your true faith. They reveal that you have faith in Jesus, but they have nothing to do with what truly saves you. They have nothing to do with what has truly saved you. And in fact, if you look at all the religions of the world, Christianity is the only religion that is not works-based. Christianity is the only major religion that is not works-based. Every other religion out there tells you that you have to do more, that you have to do enough to be considered good enough to make it to heaven. And every other religion, there's these different levels of heaven that you get into where you start thinking, oh, if I just do a little more, I can be, get a little bit better reward. It's not how Christianity works. Christianity is not works-based. In fact, it's in many ways the opposite. There is nothing that we can actually do because Christianity is grace-based. And grace is not based on merit or works or what you've done. Grace is, in fact, the unmerited gift of God. And it is only God who gives it, not because we deserve it, but because He loves us so much, He wants to give it to us. And He only requires that we do is have faith in Him, repent of our old ways, confess that Jesus is Lord, and be baptized into Him as a symbol of of our death to our old self and life to our new self. And none of those things are actually works that we do. Even baptism, which sometimes is viewed as a work, is not a work that we do. It's actually a work that is done to us when we get baptized. It is something that God does to us whenever we get baptized. You see, Christianity is not works-based at all because we know that no matter what we do, we can't do enough. And this leads us into my second point, the main point, I believe, of this parable, and that is that grace is not fair. Grace isn't fair. We spend most of our lives belly aching about how unfair life is, yet if we truly think about it, the thing that we value most, grace, which gets us into heaven, is not fair. If we were talking about fair, if we really wanted what's fair, then our ultimate destination is hell. That is what's fair. None of us can ever be good enough to get into heaven. Yet, grace is not fair. You see, fair would be that the first workers getting paid would be either getting paid more or that the last workers would get paid less. That the workers would be paid based on the amount of work that they've done. Yet Christianity is not based on this because ultimately you can never do enough to actually get the reward. Because once there's been separation from God, there's only one thing and one thing alone that can bridge that separation. And that is the cross of Jesus Christ. And the cross of Jesus Christ is grace. Because we did not deserve him to come and die for us. We did not deserve for him to take the punishment that we deserved ultimately. Yet he did it anyway as a show of grace and mercy. And this is what Christianity is based completely on, is that grace. Because when we sin, even one sin produces that separation that keeps us away from God. And there is nothing, absolutely nothing we can do to bridge that. We can't work our way into heaven because the only way to work your way into heaven is to be perfect 100% of the time. And that's just impossible. 
In fact, Romans chapter 2 actually talks a little bit about this. In the first part of Romans chapter 2, it actually talks about how there is actually two ways to heaven. The first is Jesus, and we know that way. The second one is live perfect your entire life, never make a mistake. Well, the problem is there's only been one person that was ever able to accomplish that, and that was Jesus, and he died on a cross for us. The rest of us, even from an early age, I look at my two-year-old Jameson, and he is already making mistakes. (laughs) He is already not perfect because it's impossible for him to do so. So he will grow up and not be perfect. And so that means at some point in his life when he begins to understand, he will need the grace of God. He will need the grace to cover him because he is already, will already be separated from God. There will already be a separation that has happened because it's impossible for him to be perfect. Because when we're perfect, not only do we have to follow the laws, the laws of the land and the laws that we have in this life, but we also have to follow the laws of our conscience. And so that means that never once can we actually feel guilty about anything we have done. Never once can we say, I think I may be messed up there. Never once can we think that. Because if you've sinned according to your conscience, then you've sinned and therefore are no longer perfect and therefore can no longer go to heaven. So that means it's impossible for us to do this. And so what we need, ultimately, is grace. Grace is the only way. And let's face it, grace isn't fair, but it's necessary. If God was fair, like we often want life to be, like I said before, we'd be going to hell. But because God is love, because the Bible never says that God is fair. It said He is love, and it says He is just And his justice meant someone had to suffer the penalty of sin and that someone was Jesus. But because he's love, he sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us. And that is grace. Now, even though we claim to like grace because we love the fact that we can receive grace, we often tend to still bellyache a little bit about it. Now, we may not realize we are, but we start looking at people that lived a wicked life, completely wicked life, their entire life. And at the last moment before they died, they decide to give their life over to Christ. And we begin to think to ourselves, that doesn't seem fair because Christianity can be a struggle sometimes trying to live according to what God wants. And I've been doing this my whole life. And why is it that they get to all of a sudden live however they want, but at the last moment decide to give their lives over to God and somehow be okay? That doesn't seem fair. Or maybe it's someone that has wronged you in your life and you begin to think that if anyone deserved not to have grace, it's that person because, man, I cannot stand that person for what they've done to me. They are such a horrible person for what they've done to me. Yet, whenever they come back to Christ and they give their lives over and you know because of your faith that they have grace, it begins to make you think it just doesn't seem fair that they could do that to me and yet still receive the grace of God. And we begin to start missing the point. We miss the point of everything. We miss the point that we should be fortunate to get the reward that we get, just like the master said to the first worker, didn't we agree upon this? Shouldn't I be able to do what I want to do with the money that I give you for working in my vineyard? We forget that. Shouldn't God be able to do and give the grace and salvation that he wants to give to who he wants to give it to when he wants to give it to instead of focusing in on the fair shouldn't we just be gracious and think how blessed we are to receive the grace that we get why be upset when someone else is getting the same reward as us even though we put in more work shouldn't we just be happy that we got the reward to begin with yet we tend to be uh civilization of whiners that whether you're old or young or in between you tend to like to complain about things we tend to focus in on the negative instead of the positive and instead of being happy about what's happening in our lives we tend to want to look at what's wrong with our lives rather than focusing in on the grace that we have received what we should want is what god wants and that's at all experience god's grace yet we tend to hold back a little bit on wanting them to actually get it. We start thinking about the people that maybe we don't know if we really want them here in this church. 
We don't know if we want them to hear the message of God because that means that we'd have to interact with them more. It means that we'd have to start thinking maybe that they are no better or worse than I am in the grand scheme of things. We don't like that thought because we like to compare ourselves and start deciding what's fair and not fair. But ultimately, what we should really want is that all should receive grace, and we should want everyone that in this town and in the towns around us to be in the church, to hear the message of God, to hear this message of grace. And even though fairness may be what we want, what we need is grace. And grace is undeserved by everyone There is not a single person that has deserved any merit, any little portion of grace. It's what God has given to all of us, whether you are the best of the best or the worst of the worst. You don't deserve grace any more than the person next to you, your neighbor, the person you work with, yet God wants them to receive God's grace. So the question that we have and we leave this is, who in your life have you been withholding God's grace from? Because maybe you are that person that can deliver God's grace to them. That you can tell them about God's grace and how it doesn't matter what they've done in the past. It doesn't matter who they are. What matters is that God loves them. And they, just like you, need God's grace. But they, just like you, don't deserve it. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, We are grateful that you have seen fit to give us your grace. We are grateful that you have seen fit to send your son to die as a sacrifice on the cross for us, even though we do not deserve it. I pray that we live a life of grace as we leave these doors today, that we should take your grace to everyone we meet. In Jesus' name, amen.